So here in our second week of the sermon series, uh, we have the next part of the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. And this was a church that he helped us start that basically became divided up against itself. Now, I think a good way to talk about what happened in Corinth is to explore the topic of family. Now, I had the good fortune to participate in a cohort on family systems theory and how it affects churches, and I just wanted to share a little bit about what I learned with you today. So family is one of those triggering issues for a lot of people. Uh, it is a very personal subject, about as personal as they come. If what I'm about to describe matches your situation a little too closely for comfort, it strikes a nerve, anything like that, please do what you need to do for yourself. You're not going to offend me if you have to leave and take a break. So please keep that in mind, and we'll begin. So there is an unspoken rule about being part of a good family, and it has absolutely nothing to do with biology. A functional family is kind of like an insurance policy against the world that pays out pretty much all the time when it works. You spend a lot of time fighting out in the world. Bit by bit, the world wears you down. When you return to your family, you're reminded of what's important. You get love, the batteries kind of get recharged, and you get told that you matter. Now, no matter how much the image of the family household is put down in our culture as something less than admirable, less uh, than worth striving for. Everybody has an idea of how it's supposed to work when it works well, and that is why everyone wants it on some level. Because when it works, it's fantastic. Now, sometimes families fight, and this can threaten the unspoken rule. When that happens, everybody starts to get really tense, even if they're not directly related to what caused the fight, whether it be people or a subject, because the family has started to look like the rest of the world. It is no longer a system of support. It starts to wear you down. The natural tendency is for the members to find a way to get back to the healthy place, the place before the conflict, and that can be through a lot of ways. Uh, it could be through compromise, letting bygones be bygones. Sometimes a direct intervention is necessary. But sometimes unhealthy means are used to get back to that place before the fight. You can tell right away if the peace returned through unhealthy means when the same arguments keep getting rehashed again and again. Or maybe sometimes a member develops certain bad habits uh, or a member leaves entirely or is pushed away, ostracized. That is the worst case scenario, when a member of the family is removed or leaves. Because see, some conflicts, they're just too deep, right? Too irreconcilable. Sometimes when your insurance stops working for you, you've got to change providers. That's why biology has almost nothing to do with what constitutes a family. Blood doesn't keep a family together because some hurts, some divisions, they cut too deep. But the sense of family, well, you can find that almost anywhere. All you need is enough people of the same mind in the same situation that need support from one another. Now, my biological family was torn apart due to these kinds of things. I've shared this with some of you. Bit by bit, we lost the unity that made us whole. No family is perfect, and mine was far from that. But there was always an understanding that if one of us ever got into something really, truly terrible, something really bad, we had no doubt in our minds that we would be cared for by one another, that when we needed each other the most, we'd be there for one another, supported. But you know, the day came when I asked myself, hey, does this still hold true? Often, life throws us situations where we have to make a decision with less than complete information. In this circumstance, the information was absolutely complete. There was no room for ambiguity. I don't know if that experience is universal for everyone that loses their family, 
But everything that I've learned about in my less than 40 years of life seems to say that it is. I have many regrets about how things got to that state of being, but in retrospect, I realized, and only time and maturity has allowed me these gifts, I realized that I was powerless to stop them. There was absolutely nothing I could change about myself that would have prevented the split. A family is a family because everybody wants to be a part of it, wants to contribute to it. The moment that isn't true anymore, things change fundamentally. And those remaining form a new unity, smaller than before, very different from the previous one. Often there are feelings of resentment towards the ones that left, resentments that can weaken or strengthen the bond between the remaining members. And you see this happen a lot when unhealthy behaviors result in a split. And before you today stands the Apostle Paul in the form of Scripture, begging and pleading with us to remember what's important before our unhealthy behaviors result in a split that diminishes us. He starts not by addressing the whole in a very general way, but a real specific one. He starts by saying, brothers and sisters. He could have said something like, all y'all, all of you, which is a very nonspecific way of addressing a body that doesn't single anyone out. No, he's very clear. Brothers and sisters in Christ. There is absolutely nothing in the Bible that says that we all must be the same and think the same. That has never been the goal. I think God was very intentional about creating a magnificent diversity within the body of Christ. I was asked earlier this week if it was possible to be a Christian but not go to church, and I replied, and this is just my opinion, just take it for what it's worth, yes, it is possible. There were plenty of Christians that didn't go to church in Jesus' day because there weren't any churches to go to, but they did gather. Ultimately, I believe that God expresses God's self through personal witness and communal witness. The two have always gone hand in hand. God is never just witness to one, but also to a gathered group. You see this in Scripture again and again. Now, you might retreat for a time to be in solitude with God, indeed, even our Savior and his cousin, John the Baptist, did so. And the fathers of our faith did so. They were called the Desert Fathers. They did it in the deserts that they lived nearby, too. But just like family, you go back. Eventually, you go back. You go back to your family, if only just to share the witness that you received, so all the members can benefit from it. It doesn't matter if the family has changed while you were gone, and it does. The thing that pulls you back is family, the family that God created for you in the form of Christ crucified. To never return, to stay away from family, that sounds like arrogance to me. Like I'm above family. I don't need family. That's selfishness to me. Again, my opinion. From the beginning, the Christian community was called to share within the body so that nobody had need. They had everything in common, is what Scripture says. I mean, what greater need is there than the witness of God? So if you know someone that has been apart from the body for a time, maybe the family is no longer a good fit for them. But that doesn't mean you can't help them find another family. It doesn't have to be this one. You might be all the family they need. But everybody needs a family. Paul moves on to remind the divided church of Corinth of the idea that brings them together, that has always brought them together, and this is the lordship of Jesus. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he implores the church to be in agreement with each other and to be undivided. 
It seems that the way this family, this Corinthian family, dealt with its issues was to splinter into factions. Corinth was a church where there were a lot of important Christians, a lot of big names for the time. It wasn't technically a building like this one, because Christianity was actually more home-based in those days, but not like the homes that you're thinking of. Essentially, the pater or mater familias, which is a term describing the head of a Roman household, would be baptized by a traveling evangelist, so like Paul, right? Someone who had come preaching the good news, Peter, some of the other disciples. If the head of the household was baptized, then all the members were also baptized because the head of the household was the law of the household. Some households were actually quite large in the book of Acts and some of Paul's letters describe them. In this letter, particularly just within the scope that we're looking at right now, Paul describes Chloe's people, which likely means that Chloe was the head of her household. He singled her out as the one who reported the divisions first, which probably didn't do Chloe any favors to the group. He also mentions the households of Crispus, Gaius, and Stephanus. People with households actually got named in Scripture because they had power and money. Together, the households were unified as a church. They were responsible for the evangelization of an area. In this case, it was Corinth, which was a big city, like New York, Los Angeles. From the beginning, God created the church to be unified in its diversity. Each household had its own way of doing things. Nothing has changed since then. But all were united in a common bond of fellowship through Christ, and they participated in the greater church. They collected money and goods to support the poor in their city and beyond, including working with the central church in Jerusalem, where it all got started, to serve their poor. And it worked very well for a time. The members of the Church of Corinth allowed themselves to fall into the trap of putting their preferences before the greater witness of Christ. They preferred to diminish themselves into their separate factions rather than work in unison for the greater good that God called them to. To justify themselves, they would cite an authority like Paul. I belong to Paul. I belong to Cephas, which was a pater familius. Uh, Excuse me, which was the name for Peter. Or Apollos, who might have been the head of a household or uh, possibly just a Christian teacher that had a falling out with Paul at some point but was instrumental in teaching Gentiles about Christ, Gentiles being non-Jews. Some even had the gall to claim they were following Christ himself. But just like today, it all came down to personal preference, which was really the only authority that mattered to these people anyway. Paul reminds the Corinthian church that the only authority and the only object of their devotion should be Christ. In the words of Stephen Covey, who wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he said, put first things first. Putting first things first means organizing and executing around your most important priorities. It is living and being driven by the principles that you value the most not the agendas and forces that surround you. Now, the book tells you to put what things you personally find of most worth first, what you think. The way of Christ is different. It asks you to put what Christ found of most worth first. That's what makes the church and God's kingdom fundamentally different from the world. Attend to the way of Christ first, and you find that you will have little time for anything else. On occasion, a Christian really should take stock of the activities that they're prioritizing to get a sense if they're still putting first things first. It's easy to get distracted these days, so it helps in those moments to remember your priorities and return to them. If you neglect the big things of Christ for too long with your small preferences and distractions, you're going to find it increasingly easier to abandon them altogether. It won't be long before you find yourself making excuses and justifications for why you choose to spend your time and energy the way that you do. 
just like what happened to the Corinthian church. Ultimately, Paul understood that the conduct of the faithful would directly reflect on the public's perception of the way of Jesus. Christians were often derided. They were made fun of, persecuted. People would come up with these strange rumors for them, and that served as fuel for persecution. If the church was to be successful, it needed to follow a way that was different from the way of the world. And maybe that's why it began in the home. The home is where family begins. When families are broken, it's a really big deal. It even makes the news. You've probably heard all about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's uh, royal debacle. And I don't pretend to understand what's going on there, but it's clear that people love to hear juicy gossip like that, and it reflects negatively on them. But the United Methodist Church has also been featured in the news, and it's possible schism. What kind of witness are we sending to the world about Christianity and those who call themselves Christians. Unless you believe that this church be free of blame, I can tell you that this church has had its fair share of run-ins with division since its inception. It plagues every congregation, but it doesn't always have to result in the diminishing of the body. Christ has given us freedom from the priorities of the world so we can forge a different path, but we've got to choose to accept the freedom to create a different reality. Through self-examination and prayer, we can allow God to share with us that mind of Christ that Paul spoke of. Now, before there was a Methodist church, there was a Methodist club, and it began at Oxford University in England while John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was studying there. Every week, he had a group of students gather to try and find a way to make their faith stronger through a rigorous method that was very similar to their course of study. I call people like that nerds, but I guess I'm one of them too. (laughs) They would pray, fast, visit the sick and imprisoned. They'd help the poor. They'd try to live as authentic Christians. Each day, they would ask themselves 22 questions to stay on the path. I'm not going to read all 22 to you now, but I did want to share a few. Number one, am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I'm better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Number two, am I honest in all my acts and words, or do I exaggerate? Three, am I a slave to dress, friends, work, or habits? Four, did the Bible live in me today? Do I give the Bible time to speak to me every day? Five, do I grumble or complain constantly? Six, is there anyone whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold a resentment toward, or disregard? And if so, what am I doing about it? And last, is Christ real to me? May God grant each of us the courage that we need to take our faith seriously, to keep the first things first, and to not allow the rest to destroy our families. Apart from God, family is all that we have, and God gave us our family for our good.